the JLR interview series. Okay, so it's Friday afternoon in uh, London, just coming up to 4 p.m. Uh, towards the end of June, and uh, today I'm really happy to have a fantastic guest with us, one that definitely one of the best bass players in the world, uh, someone I've had the privilege to have seen in London as well, um, and his name is Avery Sharp. So how are you today? Great, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely welcome. Um, obviously, Avery is joining us um, via Zoom call in the on the east coast of the United States, and um, it's been a very interesting time in the United States. Thinking about the um, the debate last night, but we won't get into that. Um, we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, that was. Everybody's. Everybody on the left is clutching their pearls now. I mean, Cat had a bad night, but I've been voting in, I'm sorry, I've, I've been voting in presidential elections since 1972. I couldn't wait to turn 18 to vote against uh, Richard Nixon because of the Vietnam War. And I've never seen anything like this. This this is, I got to give it to the right, the Republicans, they fall in line behind the criminals. Like, you know, anyway, Democrats are clutching their pearls because my man had a bad night and they're ready to throw him overboard. And it's, you know, yeah, we all have. I mean, I have bad nights playing, not as bad as Brother Joe Biden last night, but <laughs> it does happen. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah, it does happen, and uh, yeah, there's a lot to run in that one. There, there's no question about it. A lot to run. But so, uh, so, but you know, here we're here to talk about music. Although it's quite interesting because there's going to be some sort of connections. Um what you just said actually um because your new record which is what we're primarily here to talk about which is called i am my neighbor's keeper on jknm records is really a, a marvelous record and um you know it's an innovative record and i really i want to ask you a few things about that record in particular and the first question i have is um how did that project come about well, I, I guess kind of what we were talking about a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, people always say that, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this a number of times, um, that people always say that, especially artists, well, I'm not political. And I say that's that's bull because everybody's political. Even if you do nothing, you're being political because you're letting other people make decisions about your life, which is crazy. So... Um, you know, as uh, I've been like I've been voting in, in uh, presidential elections since 1972, since I was 18, I voted against Richard Nixon because of the Vietnam War, and I've just never seen anything like this. And I, I would say, like in the last 40 years, specifically um, in 1980, um, you had you know Ronald Reagan, Margaret Margaret Thatcher, and it was just kind of like this war on working people and the poor. And it's like, um, God loves me. That's why I'm rich. And he hates you. And you suck. That's why you're poor. Um, you know, I'm a product of the 60s and, and 70s where, you know, you had the uh, apex of the civil rights movement in, in America and uh, women's rights, gay rights, you know, disability rights. I mean, it was just a lot happening. And, you know, you had President Johnson with the... Um, a lot of social programs that he that he passed, uh, and people forget that President Nixon passed uh, started the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, because he was getting so much um, you know flack from people about the environment, which we're still dealing with. And mm -hmm. there, there, there's kind of this, um, um, you know, it's like the strong just beating up on the weak, and um, I call it the IGM. I got mine. So, you know, tough, you know, tough for you. And I just wanted to, as an artist, as I said before, you know, we're all political, whether we want to be or not, or whether we realize it or not. Uh, making a statement, yeah, that makes you political. Not making a statement also makes you political because you, you're letting other people make decisions of, about your life. So as an artist, um, I was just thinking about humanity. You know, we, we've kind of lost uh, our, our humanity. Uh, and that we don't we don't really respect other people 
it's like it's my way or the highway i know best uh you know because god told me or whatever somebody told me somebody's the authority that told me and it, i just really want you know people to kind of get back to their humanity so so that's why i i wrote this this album i am my neighbor's keeper you know we nobody gets nobody gets to where they are by themselves you know i mean mm -hmm. i'm i'm a you know famous jazz musician and i had and t people say what's the, the the key to my success i had two incredible parents you know who, who raised me and supported me and my mother was a piano player and you know in the church of god in christ sanctified church you know mm -hmm. so you know and even you know rich people are like oh, like i did all this by myself no you didn't somebody mm -hmm. somebody along the way helped you somebody along the way even inspired you even if they didn't help you you know necessarily financially you know, if you, if you see that in my background, I have, you know, Muhammad Ali, <laughs> uh, you know, those people in, inspired us, you know, not only with their talent, but with their, their stances on, on humanity. And so that, that's sort of just sort of the crux of, you know, why that's how the, the project got started. And that was just my, you know, me trying to say my little piece about trying to get us back to humanity. Hmm. So I mean, so basically, you you believe it, it it's possible when we haven't gone too far the other way yet. No, I always I'm a, I'm an optimist, and I always believe in uh, human beings. Unfortunately, when when we experience the worst, we're actually at our best. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you know the the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust that happened. I mean, that's you know that's a travesty. But it was in something that grew out of that, you know, the whole American slavery um, industry, um, something grew out of that. You know, human beings, it was, it, I mean, it's unfortunate human beings have to go through that. But one of the things that came out of that atrocity was the music, it was, it was a, a, a music mm -hmm. that black folks created and gave to the world and has affected the entire world. You know, I always tell people, try to hear American music or try to hear yeah, try to hear American music without the uh, African American or the Black influence. It, it, it would sound, you know, you can't even you can't even imagine that. Uh, so mm, I just does it exist? Say it again. Does that exist? Um, no, no, no it doesn't, does it? No, even the Americana, anything you want to mention. Right. I mean, a lot of people, for instance, are not aware that the banjo was an African instrument originally. And the violin, and it was right. sort of precursor to the to the. Uh, and some people debate, well, it wasn't really. Yes, it, well, it, it happened in Africa first. Sorry, y'all, Be, before it was happening in Europe. So I mean, and to think that we have all these regions and we think that people don't didn't travel or mix or whatever. P human mm. beings are human beings. They're going to travel. It's just, I mean, the technology is different. I mean, I can get on a plane and be in London, and, you know, in five six hours. You know, it took them a couple of months to get there, but people, you know, people did travel. So, you know, yeah. there's always this uh, mixture of people and, and culture. I mean, you put you put men and women together. I don't care where they're from, black, white, or whatever. People are going to get together and create. Uh, you know, uh, keep the human species. Uh, keep the human species going. Yeah, and you know. Um... See, one of the questions I was going to ask you about it, because the music is really, really innovative, and there's clearly a lot of fusion of different things going on. Um, I, you know, I've heard your previous records, which I really like as well. Um, you don't stick to what I would call um, that typical straight-ahead jazz formula. Um, is that something that you're conscious of, or is it just something that how the music, your music happens, basically? Well, it's kind of just the way things happen. I mean, I, my my background is varied. I mean, I came up playing, you know, gospel music in the church, and mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get really into jazz, quote unquote, uh, more uh, acoustic jazz. I mean, when you say the word jazz, that that con con uh, conjures up a number of different types of music. That that conjures up John Coltrane to Kenny G. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Because of my background, being raised in the church, being raised in gospel music, and then playing, uh, you know, when I was in high school, funk music or rhythm and blues or soul music, we used to call, you know, the Motown, 
James Brown, Wilson Pickett. And I really didn't uh, graduate into really jazz until I got into uh, into college when I, I was fortunate enough to be at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, Mass. And Max Roach was one of my professors, Archie Shep, Reggie uh -huh. Work played with John Coltrane with my first bass teacher, upright teacher. Yeah. And um so I you know I was I was very very fortunate to be here at that, you know, to be in at the University of Massachusetts at that time. Horace Boyer, who was one of the foremost authorities on gospel music, came came out of the same church that I did, who was also a, a gospel performer in his own right. You had Fred Tillis who helped um Start the jazz program at University of Mass. It wasn't a jazz program when I was there uh, as, a, as an undergraduate. And before his name became a bad word, you had Bill Cosby who was working on his master's and got his doctorate from the University of Massachusetts. Billy Taylor got his doctorate. Great Billy Taylor got his doctorate mm -hmm. from the uh, University of Massachusetts. I mean, so it was really one of the uh, people who was there at the time. I spoke to him years after that period kind of had passed. And he said, yeah, they were trying to create a black think tank and it had all these great people and Fred Tillis who I mentioned before who helped start the the, uh, the, jazz, the jazz program at UMass helped facilitate bringing in these people like Archie and Max and, and Reggie so I just happened to be there at that time you know and and my wife says one of the keys to my success is I always take advantage of opportunities that are right in front of me mm -hmm. whereas a lot of people will not or stand back i mean i didn't i mean i read about these people i didn't really know these people about these people until they were there and then i was told who they were and i was like oh my god <laughs> and i think because i was a very uh anxious student you know anybody who teaches if you have a student who's like really into it that prods you on too and you kind of get more into that student and that's kind of what happened with me I, th I think i was just so excited about music and excited about these people that they spent extra time with me max you know um max is the one that's really responsible for me being able to play with every drummer from 1980 to now every major drummer because he taught me how to listen to to drummers um mm. Uh, it was just a sort of a fluke i think uh he and i and another person showed up classes had been canceled and he just sat there and just he started talking about different um, people and, you know, musicians that he came up with who had great time and who didn't have good time. And I was a little surprised that he, you know, he was like, no, so-and-so didn't have good time. I didn't have work. <laughs> but, um, you, know, you know, so and then Archie Shep spent a lot of time with me. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him in class. He wasn't really in the music department. He was in the Afro-Am department. But he right. taught a class that was music but they had it at the, at the in the music department even though it wasn't it was an actual afro am class and it was a great class uh it was a, a long ensemble and you know sometimes archie would show up an hour or two hours late and we would the class was supposed to be two or three hours and it wound up being like four hours we'd be playing all night it was, it was really a, a, a lot of fun and he used i used to go to his house when i the first year i started playing bass and he would play piano and he'd go, ah, oh, no, nah, man, Garrison would have played, Jimmy Garrison would have played this line. You know, Jimmy Garrison, the great bass player from the John Coltrane yeah. Um, group. But, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, um, you know, just following on from that, I, I, I wonder, and you can let me know what you think, because the way you approach the, uh, especially the double bass, you know, you, <laughs> with all those slapping techniques and everything, you don't come approach it from, the way I, I'm not going to mention names, but you know, um, bass players who I really like, by the way. But mm -hmm. um, so I won't mention names because it wouldn't make any sense. But they approach it from a more conventional manner, but you're approaching it from a totally different direction, almost you know, like what you're saying, R and B and stuff like that. I mean, would you uh, go along with that? Was it because you yeah. started at a slightly later time, or? Well, you know, it's really funny. Um, I just I started on electric. And then I went to upright, but I kept playing the electric. Like I said, Reggie was my first bass teacher. The first year I started right. upright, I didn't know jack about it. He showed me how to tune it. And the first thing he said was, I don't play electric, but he said, he, he heard me play electric. He's like, man, you've only been playing like two years and you really got it on your hands. He says, hmm. that's, that's your generation. 
but he said, focus most of your time on upright, which is what I did. And now people see, see me play, they're like, well, you, you play it almost like an electric, you're upright like an electric. And like, I'm, that doesn't offend me at all. It's like, well, yeah, because I, you know, formulated my own technique. I, I don't sound like anybody else because because of my background and because of the way that I, that I approach the instrument. And, but with all that said, yes. when you, hear, when you hear me play and when you hear me play traditional jazz, I'm swinging. Oh yeah. As, yeah. Matter, as a matter of fact, all of the cats that, uh, you know, max generations and down that I played with, the first thing that they say is, Avery, man, you got great time. You know, I played with art. It, it funny, the, the trio with uh, McCoy Tyner and Lewis Hayes, Lewis didn't really know who I was. This was we, the, McCoy formed the trio back in 84. And yeah. I had played with McCoy from 1980 to 1982. And Lewis didn't really know who I was. And so I was like, are you Lewis Hayes or are you his son? Because Lewis looks so good. <laughs> I was like, you know, Lewis Hayes is supposed to be old. You, you know, you look, he just started laughing. And so we played the first tune. And after we, you know, we did a rehearsal. First time I'm meeting Lewis and, you know, and after the first tune, he puts his stick down and goes to McCoy. He goes, McCoy, this boy can titty boom, which means I can swing. I mean, Lewis Hayes played with all the bass players that I studied. And also I got the 411 on their playing and their personalities from Lewis from being on the road with him for six years with McCoy. But so I can, you know, I, I can I can play jazz. I can play oh, yeah, tra of traditional where everybody else, I, I can, there's nobody who can swing harder than me. But with that said, I I don't like to to kind of stay in that in that vein, you know. I'm trying. I'm I'm hearing different stuff, and I'll tell you the bass player, who actually, kind of I took permission to do that from, and that's Cecil McBee, because Cecil, Cecil was, McBee, you know, yeah, of you know Cecil's of the generation of like Reggie Workman's generation, yes. Ron Parker, and I always thought Cecil was a little younger than those cats. Cecil's actually a little older than those cats, but Cecil would I would listen to his playing. He was always adventurous, you know. He was playing, yeah, you know, but he. he but he was always being adventurous. And I, and every, and, you, know, you know, when I got on the scene and when I would meet him, I said, see, so whatever you play, I'm going to steal it. You know? So he would just say, Oh, leave me alone. I'm an old man. I said, no, man, you, you gave me permission to, to stretch and not just stay in the, the, the same vein that everybody's like, if you don't play like this, then you're not really playing, you know? Yeah. Well, can I interject there? Because, um, this is the important point as far as I'm concerned. You never ever overplay. Because the, what you're saying is that sounds like someone might have a tendency to overplay and overdo it in, in the context of the of the music, but you never do that. You just get it right all the time. Yeah. I, you know, as Max Roche used to say, don't, you know, to drummers, he said, don't play the drums, play the song. So yes. it depends on whom. Now, I will overplay, but it all depends on who I'm playing with and what I'm playing. And sometimes if I'm recording with somebody, I'll say, you know, back me up. I'll back off if you want me to. If you don't, if you hired me because I'm Avery Sharp, then I'm going to add some things. I'm not going to run you over. And that's funny. You, you you talk about that. And and that's, I mean, not to pat myself on the back, but that's a skill. And the, that was the reason why I played with McCoy for so long. Because... Mm. McCoy will drop kick you off the stage playing wise. He'll just play, he'll just knock you off the stage. But if you have enough uh, fortitude to hang with him and kind of push him just a little bit, you know, not, not to try to outplay him. I can't outplay McCoy, but just add just the right amount of pressure when he's playing that sort of catapult him rather than, because I've seen other, I won't mention any names, I've seen other bass players because I've taken off, I used to take off every, from time to time and do other projects. That's why people are surprised, like, oh, you've been doing all this stuff? Like, yeah, I was doing all this stuff with, with McCoy. You know, I would take off in, you know, a week or a month and, and, and do a project. And um, it would get some cats that 
you know, I listened to and learned from. And then he would get some cats who were like of my generation. And I would say, well, okay, so how'd the gig go? He go, ah. And he would say like, ah, that meant. And one of the bass players called me and said, oh man, yeah, it's easy to play with McCoy. And I was thinking, McCoy's not going to call you again because you didn't give him that push that he needed. You, you let him run. If Even though you don't know it, you let him run over you. Yeah. And, and those people couldn't understand why it's like, I mean, what's it about this bass player until people would see us play? I remember Pat Metheny came up to see us play years ago in Boston and Bruce Lundvall, uh, you know, the record exec from Blue Note and... Um, yeah, yeah, I know the name, yes. Yeah, so Blue, he, Pat came to see us one time and he goes, Avery, you and McCoy got something else going on. I mean, Pat would know that because he was with Lyle Mays for, for years. You start to, it, something else starts to happen. You know, is, yeah. are, are you the greatest player, whatever that is? Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't matter, but that it becomes almost like a marriage. You know, I, I knew exactly how much to push McCoy without getting in his way and without trying to overplay him. It's yeah. like, which is what a bass player is supposed to be. You're supposed to support somebody. And as a great a player as McCoy is, it would blow your mind because he's playing so much stuff. It's like, well, what do I do? This cat is playing too much stuff. Well, you, you know, you play his left hand. Some bass players, oh, don't, you know, just, I won't say mention any name. They would say, you know, from here on down, don't play any bass notes. And I'm like, I'm going to play those, those double those lines with him. You know, um, one time we did a gig at um, the Village Vanguard and uh, Harold Mayburn, great piano player, came to see us. I think it might have been the trio. I'm not sure if it was me, McCoy, and Aaron Scott. But I'd been playing with McCoy a little bit, you know, a while. And Harold goes, he goes, yeah, man, that last tune y'all played, uh, the bass line, was that your line or McCoy's line? And I had to think about it. I was like, um, no, that was my line. But I think I think that's the line that he would have played in that in yeah. that situation. But uh, it, but that's the kind of relationship that we had, you know. I, it, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I saw you, um, but it was with Aaron Scott on drums. Okay. This is 1999 at the Jazz Cafe. It, it was almost like a religious experience after mm -hmm. about an hour. It, I've never actually experienced anything quite like that in a live setting. It was uh, quite amazing what the three of you were able to pull off and get the really, the audience really into it. As you know, Jazz Cafe is a great venue. Yeah. <laughs> for, for that, I, I, you know. I, I dug that place because people were standing up and they were into yeah. it. You know? it yeah, it's so, it's so unique. But if, I, I wish more jazz venues were like that, where you could stand and enjoy the music. It's just, it's just sitting down. It really right. makes a big difference. But yeah, it, it, was, it was quite an amazing experience. And I, I want to ask you another thing, though, about your new album. What, what is a double quartet? Because you've got a double quartet, and I'm not quite sure what that is. Well, a double quartet is two quartets. So uh, that's all it is. Yeah, because you know, my quartet was piano, bass, drums, and uh, bilophone with African percussion. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, regular string quartet with two violins, viola, and cello. So that's why I call it a double quartet. Okay, so they're all playing together at the same time. Right, right. Okay, okay. Right. And what about um, the other musicians who appear on, 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 the, on the set? Do you want to tell the listeners uh, who they are? Okay, I have um, Zakai Curtis on piano. He's uh, sort of, uh, I guess, well, I would say young and upcoming, but he's, he's been a, been on the scene for a little while. He's sort of an Eddie Palmieri um, protege. He actually is. Oh, yeah. And he's originally from the Hartford, Connecticut area. And, he, you know, he played with um, Donald Harrison, uh, Lakeisha Benjamin. She, he played with her for a while. Yes. He recorded with her. But Zakai is an incredible player. I had um, Yoron, Yoron Israel on drums. Yoron is, you know, used to play. Yeah, with, no. He played with everybody from um, Ahmed Jamal to, you know. Is he, and, he's from the 80s sort of generation. Say what? Is he from the 80s generation? 
Uh, 80s, 90s. Yeah, 80s, 90s. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. he's from Chicago originally. Yeah, I haven't heard his name for a while, but I remember when I first started getting into jazz, I heard his name. Oh, yeah, he's he's the um, percussion, what do you call it, head of the percussion department at Berkeley now. And he's okay. been there for a while. And he's still, you know, still doing a lot of touring. And um, I have a bilophone player, African percussionist, who's been around for quite some time, uh, Tony Vaca. Mm -hmm. And uh, he plays a lot with cats from Senegal. And, you know, he does a lot of world music. And I had... Uh, on violin, I had uh, Sarah, Sarah uh, Briggs, and uh, the other violinist was uh, Kayla Grafe, and viola mm -hmm. was uh, Gregory uh, Dio, and on cello, because if you listen to the record, there's a couple. Of all the string players, the cello player was the only one that was able to improvise, and that was uh, Dave Hahi on, on cello. And I don't know if you saw the video that I did of two of the tunes I did. Uh, well, the one tune, that's online is my friend don't be afraid to ask for help and i had an african dancer from um, guinea um in the studio while we recorded i had gotten a grant from new england foundation for the arts and for three four three or four of the tunes i had him in the studio dancing you know to kind of give us inspiration as well and you see it on on the video as well. As a matter of fact, yeah, I'll have to check that. Yeah, um, yes, it's called you know, don't be afraid, my friend, don't be afraid to ask for help. It's the video. Yeah. Oh, um, fantastic. Yeah, so you know, just trying to do something a little, a little different. Trying to use mm -hmm. the, trying to and, as they say, think outside the box, or maybe as, as Dupac Chopra said, there there is no box. So right. No, 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 exactly. And um, sadly, I'm running out of time a bit here. Um, so one thing I need to ask you is what about uh, touring the record? Do you get to tour Europe or the UK um, not, with, with this? No, not so far, not with this group. I just have a few hits coming up here in, in the States. Um, but I will be in Europe actually... I leave Wednesday, a couple of days, three about two or three days uh, from now. I okay. will be in Europe with the uh, McCoy Tyner Legends. It's uh, you know an all star band of people who played with McCoy. Of course, right. I'm the musical director because I played with McCoy more than anybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, twenty years with him, probably at least twenty five records with him. Um, but on the we have Steve Torre on trombone. Yeah, he's great a great trombone player. player. Yeah, Steve is great and also does, you know, plays shells. I've got yeah, Ronnie, yes. Ronnie Barrage on drums, who uh, I first I, met with McCoy. Ronnie. The first two years I was oh, with really? McCoy, Ronnie, I got there in February and Ronnie got there like in May or June. And he and I, you know, hooked up immediately in terms of playing. And I've yeah, got, uh, the first I heard of him was with um, Barbara Dennerline. Really? The German Hammond organist. She he was in he, he was on the, one of her first records. Great mm -hmm. drummer. This is no, the late eighties. Yeah, well when he was with the gig with McCoy, he was like 18, 19 years old. Yeah. So he just so and I was in my, you know, early mid twenties and you know, I sort of became like a big brother to him. And he's you no, know, he's a very creative cat. He's a you know child prodigy, he's just incredibly incredibly creative. And we got uh, Chico Freeman on saxophone. Yeah, now you played on uh, you played on a few of his records because I've, I've got a great record of his from the early two thousand, which you played on. Yeah, and he yeah. also the first record I did with McCoy, uh, the Legends of the Hour, the La Leyenda de la Hora. Oh yes, yeah, I understand that. He was on that. Um, um, Bobby Hutchison, um, Hubert Law. Marcus Bell, uh, Marcus Belgrave on mm -hmm. trumpet. Uh, Paquito de Rivera, he just got into uh, you know the U.S. from Cuba. Right. Had to, and uh, Anasio Barro was on drums. It was funny because Anasio, I was speaking my little broken Spanish. But that's how we communicated on the on the on the record. And uh, Daniel Ponce was on uh, percussion. This is on there. Hebrew Laws, Bobby Chico. 
Um, so yeah, Chico recorded uh, with McCoy back then. And I think we did a live record at Montreal that Chico's on. And uh, I think in the late 2000s, we did a, a couple of European tours and Japan with, with, with a trio in uh, Chico. Um, yeah. And then we have Antonio Ferrero on uh, keyboards. He's from Italy, so he's playing the uh, McCoy. Okay. Yeah, so oh, you know, no. Chico. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, so we're going to be in Bulgaria on Thursday. Wow. France, and then um, we're supposed to, we're doing about two and a half weeks in July total. And then uh, we come back again in November, and we actually will be in London at the um, uh, Pizza Express. Is, Pizza Express is called. Yeah, I think that's in the in in the heart of London. Pizza yeah. Express Soho. Yeah, we'll be there. In nice venue. Day. So that that that'll be good. Yeah, it's not that far from Ronnie Scott's, if I remember right. It's literally it's about probably five minutes by foot. <laughs> yeah, because really close. I remember playing at Ronnie Scott's and walking over there. Um, yeah. I don't remember the place. I remember I walked in there. That was years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, fantastic. So, obviously, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that and to get the exact dates and everything in November. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thanks a lot this for this interview. And this is a great record. I really enjoy it. And we'll play a lot of tracks. It's got so many different things going on. You know, um, there's one track, sadly, I can't remember the name of it at the moment. It's kind of like a, there's no, it's just you on the bass, I, I think. And then at the end, you start playing a slap electric bass. Oh, it's a six on six. Yes. I'm playing, I'm playing a six string double bass, which. Six string double bass. Yes, I know. No, I only know one other person that plays that, and that's uh, Ratso Harris. Uh, oh, Rexel Harris. Yeah, I know that name. He played Janet Lawson. Yeah, he he has a six a six string double bass. I I think he plays mostly the six string stick bass, right. but uh, six string double bass is like spotting a unicorn. You know, you're not going to see it. And mm -hmm. so the reason why I call it six on six, I'm playing a uh, six string double bass, which is crazy. It's a huge bass, and I play six string electric on it. So. Well, you know, as we said before, innovation from beginning to end. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as you get older, you're just trying to keep the these neurons going. You know, you want to keep them going for as long as you can. You know, so my wife, as she says, I have issues. She said I should be playing a smaller bass as the older I get, but I go and play a larger bass. But you have to understand my, uh, well, my father was, you know, you know, we we won't go around the mountain we'll go over the mountain or through it because why not because we can try you know why well, not that's a good way to 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 end to, to end really thanks a lot for the interview uh thank you thanks for having me appreciate it thanks
the JLR Interview Series.